Okay, well, I think we're going to get started at 702. Good evening, everybody. Um, just so you know, tonight's speaker event is being recorded. My name is Katherine Matthews, and I'm the Director of Education at Old North Illuminated. We want to welcome you to tonight's speaker series event, and thank you for your support of our programming. At Old North, one of our goals is to tell the stories of all the people and communities that are part of our site's physical, spiritual, and social history. In recognition of that, I'd like to acknowledge that Old North Church sits on land that was once the land of the Massachusetts people. By the time Old North was built in 1723, the Massachusetts people had been driven and displaced from their homes and decimated by disease and warfare. Their story and suffering has been obscured in the historical record, yet they survive and the memories of their ancestors live on in the Massachusetts community. As always, let us think about the lessons of history and learn from them. Tonight's talk is being presented in a slightly different format. We'll be doing Q&A at the end as we always do. Please put your questions or comments into the Q&A rather than the chat. We'll be monitoring both, but it'll just be a little bit easier if we try to keep them all in the same place. You might wanna just take a second now to locate the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. You just have to type in your question or comment, hit return. I'll see it and I'll be able to share it with Professor Silverman and the rest of the audience. And now to tonight's program. If you have visited Old North lately or attended other speaker events, you probably have noticed that we are committed to sharing the full, sometimes messy, often complicated story of our site through its 300 years. Our goal is to go beyond the simple, even mythologized retellings of the colonial era and to challenge ourselves with the complexity of history that can be hard to hear and hard to reconcile with what many of us grew up learning. Now, the story of Thanksgiving, as we learned it in kindergarten, can be fairly described as a national myth that took hold in the 19th century. The true story of that 17th century event is an example of complicated, hard history. Understanding the context and impact of that history is a challenge, and it demands that we listen to many, many different voices and perspectives. Tonight, we will listen to one perspective, one entry point that we hope encourages folks to learn more. Professor David Silverman is a professor of history at George Washington University, where he specializes in Native American, colonial American, and American racial history. He is the author of several acclaimed books, including This Land is Their Land, the focus of tonight's talk, as well as many, many, many articles and reviews. So now it is my pleasure to pass the mic to Dr. David Silverman. Thank you, Catherine, and uh, and for those remarks, um, which I think are appropriate for for tonight. I'm going to be doing a screen share here. Let me make sure make sure everything is up. Just a moment there. All right, great. We're in order. Um, let me just first say um, how honored I am to to be here. I was born and raised in the Boston area, born in Medford, raised in Chelmsford. I'm a lifelong Boston sports fan, and uh, whenever I would take out of out of towners to uh, Boston, visit Old North was always one of my uh, my favorite stops. So I'm I'm just delighted to be here with you tonight. Um, I'm beaming to you from my university office, about four blocks west of the White House, where you could still hear the sighs of relief from <laughs> from. The, uh, from the midterms. Um, before I turn to the heart of this talk, let me offer a few contextual remarks. It might be jarring to some members of this audience uh, to see the word Indians in my book title and to hear me use it um, during tonight's talk. We, we all know that Indians is a misnomer uh, propagated by Europeans and eventually appropriated by indigenous people themselves. After all, most of us, I think it's safe to assume, are not in India. Now, 
in in recent decades, of course, some people have substituted the term Native Americans for Indians in an effort to be both more accurate and racially sensitive. The reason I use the term is that uh, throughout my 20 plus years of doing research on indigenous people and reaching out to the descendant communities, I've I've learned that most Native people within the United States, certainly not all, but most, at least that's been my impression, uh, favor the term Indian when referring to them in the aggregate, though almost to a person, uh, they prefer tribal names when appropriate. I should also note that Indian is still a legal term in the United States. Indian country is a place in United States jurisprudence. Uh, the Bureau of Indian Affairs, uh, right down the street from where I'm sitting uh, right now, uh, still uses the term. The, the point I'm trying to make is that I'm using this term out of deference to the indigenous people I know, not indifference. I also want to emphasize that though my book focuses on historical Wampanoag people and strives to include their voices at every opportunity, let's be perfectly clear, I'm not Wampanoag, and this is not a book written from a modern Wampanoag perspective. Now, I should emphasize that one of the reasons I wrote this book is because in the course of my conversations with modern Wampanoag people, they told me repeatedly how difficult Thanksgiving season was for them, which sparked my interest in the, in the topic. I should also note I solicited responses to drafts of this book by um, circulating the draft among historically minded Wampanoag colleagues and discussing um, their responses to it. Nevertheless, the responsibility for all the editorial decisions in the book and in my talk tonight belong to me alone. And at the end of the day, I've had to make a number of hard judgment calls based on the standards of my discipline of history and my own personal <laughs> understanding of the events in question. Uh, and so I want to urge everyone here tonight uh, to seek out the Wampanoag's own tellings of this history. They're widely available uh, on, on the web. All you have to do is type Wampanoag Thanksgiving and you'll see interviews and, and articles uh, uh, come up. And my hope is that you tonight um, and any Wampanoag people who are on this uh, on this call will see a, a an informed and well-intentioned attempt to, to fulfill the Native American call to take Native American history seriously within the context of a greater American history. Now, for generations, Americans have been telling themselves a patriotic story of the supposed first Thanksgiving that treats colonization as a consensual bloodless affair. In this tale, the pilgrims, religious dissenters from England, cram aboard the Mayflower to brave the stormy Atlantic in search of freedom of conscience in America. The story goes that these sea-tossed adventurers land off Cape Cod with a copy of their proto-constitution, the Mayflower Compact, and after some fruitless exploring and brief contacts with the natives, decide to found their settlement up the coast at a place they call Plymouth. Yet the future of the colony is very much in doubt during its first couple of months, because the Indians, rarely identified by tribe, on whom the English know they must depend for food and protection, seem to be at best wary and shy, and at worst, hostile. However, eventually the natives reach out to the newcomers through the interpreter Samoset and Squanto. The story sidesteps the obvious question of how these figures had managed to learn English, uh, nor does it explain why the Indians suddenly were so friendly. The native's chief, Usamequin, who the English know by his title, Massasoit, even agrees to a treaty of alliance with Plymouth. Over the spring and summer, the natives feed the pilgrims and teach them how to plant corn and where to fish, whereupon the colony begins to thrive. That fall, the two parties seal their friendship with the famous First Thanksgiving. The peace that follows permits colonial New England and by extension, modern America to become blessed seats of freedom, democracy, Christianity, and plenty. As for what happens to the Indians next, this story has nothing to say. The native's legacy in the myth is to present America as a gift to white people, or in other words, to concede to colonialism. Like Pocahontas or Sacagawea, 
some of the other famous Indians of early American history, they help the colonizers and then move off stage. Note that the native people who are remembered in American myth are the ones who helped. Now, the Wampanoags who are who of what is now southeastern Massachusetts, who are the Indians in this drama, have long contended that this isn't history, but a myth that sugarcoats the viciousness of colonialism for indigenous people. My book in this talk tonight reckons with that uncomfortable assertion and its implications. For instance, in traditional accounts of Thanksgiving, the pilgrims step on to Plymouth Rock and into a new world or wilderness, terms that are still commonplace today and when we're uh, speaking about this time and place. But in fact, human civilization in the Americas was every bit as rich and ancient as in Europe. History did not begin for the Wampanoags or any other indigenous people with the arrival of the Mayflower or Europeans. They already had a dynamic past, countless generations old, that shaped who they were and what they did. In other words, they too inhabited an old world. And the so-called wilderness in which the English arrived was already full of villages, roads, cornfields, historic monuments, cemeteries, and forests cleared of underbrush, all by native design. And you can get a sense of what I'm talking about uh, through this drawing of the Wampanoag community of Patuxet on the very site where the English would found Plymouth. And this was drawn by the French explorer Samuel de Champlain in 1605, 15 years before the pilgrim's arrival. So I'm saying the Wampanoags have an ancient history. They also have a recent history before the arrival of the Mayflower that mattered too. Though the Thanksgiving myth suggests that the meeting of the pilgrims and the Wampanoags was a first contact episode. In fact, it was just one in a string of bloody encounters between the Wampanoags and Europeans that stretched back to at least 1524. Let me emphasize that date. 1524 is the first documented contact between the Wampanoags and Europeans. And from the year 1602 onward, those contacts became regular. Um, several of them would occur practically every summer, and they tended not to go well, as yet another drawing uh, by Samuel de Champlain captures. The Thanksgiving myth portrays the Wampanoags as timid and overawed by the pilgrims, but I show that the Wampanoags were easily the stronger party during Plymouth's early years. The English did not dictate to the Wampanoags. Instead, the Wampanoags initially used Plymouth Colony as a pawn in their tribal and intertribal politics, which were dynamic, deeply complex. It might come as a surprise to many of you that, and I hate to disappoint everyone, but that celebrated first Thanksgiving feast actually played a minor role in this relationship. Hardly any of the participants ever mentioned it again. Far more influential in shaping the alliance were a series of other less palatable, less celebratory episodes filled with violence and power politics. I also submit that our emphasis on the nearly 50 years of formal peace following the first Thanksgiving and its associated treaty of 1621 elides the far more important point that the Wampanoags came to resent the colonists' aggressive and underhanded expansion. The truth, is, the truth is this, the English and the Wampanoags nearly came to blows repeatedly during that supposed long peace. And that was especially the case after the death of Usamequin in 1660, culminating in the terrible King Philip's War of 1675-76. Most histories that bother to include the Wampanoags at all, they typically end with this war. But my book contends that accounting with the Thanksgiving myth as a white lie requires tracing Wampanoag struggles with colonialism through the centuries right up to the present day. And I think this perspective is especially urgent 
as our country today grapples with new manifestations of white nationalism, while at the very same time, indigenous people in New England and all across the country are reasserting their political, economic, and cultural sovereignty. In order to understand these dual developments, we need long-term historical perspectives. So to explore these themes and to bring historic Wampanoag voices to the foreground, I'm gonna focus this talk tonight on three cases spread across the centuries in which Wampanoags and other native people closely affiliated with them posed counter narratives to white people's triumphalist histories. And our first revisionist historian appropriately, I think, is none other than the Wampanoag sachem or chief, Pometacom, better known to history as King Philip. In the late spring of 1675, some 50 years after his father, Usamequin or Massasoit, had greeted the pilgrims, Pometacom sat down to talk with a delegation of English magistrates from the colony of Rhode Island. So what you're seeing here is a map of Wampanoag country, and the talk takes place at this location right here. Now the Rhode Islanders were there to encourage the sachem to agree to a peaceful arbitration of the Wampanoag's mounting tensions with Plymouth Colony, which seemed to be leading to war. Yet they discovered when they arrived at the location for this conference, Montop or modern day Bristol, uh, Bristol Rhode Island, that Pometacom had already resolved to fight and agreed to this conference simply to explain why. Fortunately for us, um, the, uh, the leading Rhode Island magistrate, the Lieutenant Governor of Rhode Island, John Easton, recorded what Pometacom had to say that day. So let's, let's consider his words. Pometacom viewed the history of Wampanoag English relations is little more than the colonists' failure to live up to the principles of the 1621 alliance. The sachem recalled that when the pilgrims first settled at Plymouth 55 years earlier, his father, Usamequin, and I quote here, was as a great man, and the English as a little child. And here's Usamequin's mark on an English land deed. Pometacom contended, and he was right, that Usamequin could have wiped out the infant colony if he had wished. But instead, he held back its many native enemies, fed the starving colonists, and granted them land. Now, Pometacom was selective in this, in this history. He conveniently left out that his father had made this choice less out of altruism than a need for allies. For the Wampanoags had been hobbled by an epidemic introduced by some European exploring vessel, which ravaged them between 1616 and 1619, wiping out the majority of their population. And in their weakness, their rivals to the West, the Narragansett people, began subjugating them. Pometacom also overlooked his father's desire to become the point man in trade with the English in order to consolidate his authority over the loose and via the epidemic frayed Wampanoag polity. But generally, Pometacom was correct that Plymouth would have become yet another in the already long history of English lost colonies if it hadn't been for Wampanoag largesse. And how did Plymouth show its gratitude decades later, now that it had become the great man? Well, Pometacom, whose mark you see here, cited the example that in 1662, Plymouth had arrested and he alleged fatally poisoned his brother, Wamsutta, or Alexander as the English knew him, because the English feared, correctly I think, that he was plotting an anti-colonial league. More recently, the English had used Christian Wampanoag testimony to arrest, try, and execute three of Pometacom's leading men for the supposed murder of another Christian Wampanoag, John Sassaman, who had been leaking intelligence to colonial authorities. To Pometacom, Plymouth's executions of the accused Sassaman murderers and its presumed assassination of Wamsutta were bad enough, 
as discrete events. But what made them worse is that they crystallized a vast array of English wrongs, which had accumulated over the decades. Pometicom denounced that in English courts, and I quote again, if 20 honest Indians testified that an Englishman had done them wrong, it was as nothing. But if one of the worst Indians testified against any Indian suspected by the English, that was sufficient. The English had begun to interfere in criminal matters between Wampanoags within Wampanoag territory, which was really raising the stakes. Pometicom railed, and I quote again, that whatever was only between Indians and not in English townships, they would not have us prosecute. About half of the Wampanoags, mostly on Cape Cod and the islands of Martha's Vineyard and Nantucket, had adopted Christianity and sworn off Pometicom's leadership, including the responsibility to pay him tribute, or taxes, if you will. And they feared no reprisal from the sachem because via their Christianity, they now enjoyed English protection. And there were still other issues, as if this list wasn't already long enough. The English used land deeds, some fair, some foul, to claim Wampanoag territory for their own exclusive use under their own exclusive jurisdiction. Well, this ran counter to the natives' expectations that their land sales merely conveyed permission for the English to settle among them, or in other words, to become part of Wampanoag society. When native people resisted, colonists flooded the contested tracks with livestock and slapped any Indians who injured the animals with trumped up criminal fines and lawsuits. The point was to force native people to release their claims and resign themselves to the English interpretations of these land deeds. Machinations like this gave colonists, as Pometicom put it, 100 times more land than now the king, meaning Pometicom himself, had for his own people. To the Wampanoags then, English law, which was becoming dominant in southern New England, was but a shakedown by people with short memories and thin loyalty. Given these patterns, Pometicom asked rhetorically, why would he put any faith in the negotiated settlement as proposed by Rhode Island? History already taught that the English would just use some technical violation as an excuse to confiscate his land or even to murder him. The Rhode Islanders, seeing where this conversation was headed, cautioned Pometicom that it would be suicidal for the Wampanoags to resort to arms because, they said, the English were too strong for them. Well, in that case, the sachem retorted, and I quote here, then the English should do to them, the Wampanoags, as they did when they were too strong for the English. In other words, he called on colonists to assume the role of the great man by acting with generosity, restraint, and justice towards the Wampanoag little child. And that's where the talk ended, because everyone knew that that wish was futile. Just days later, Pometicom led a Wampanoag force against nearby English towns, prompting a war that would engulf the entire region and ultimately break the back of Native American power in southern New England. This war, known to us today as King Philip's War, is the most basic feature of Wampanoag-English relations that the Thanksgiving myth studiously ignores. Initially, Wampanoag resistance fighters got the best of it by repeatedly sacking exposed English settlements and ambushing troops on the march. Furthermore, soon they had a great deal of support, drawing the help of the Nipmucks from the Worcester area, the Narragansetts, their, own rival, their old rivals, and various Wabnaki bands from the Connecticut River Valley, like the Pecumtucks and Sokokis, whom the colonists turned into enemies by violating their neutrality such as trying to confiscate their arms or demanding them to turn over Wampanoag non-combatants that had taken refuge with them. 
The English made things even worse for themselves by treating the thousands of Christian Indians who pledged fealty to the colonies at the beginning of the war as wolves in sheep's clothing. Massachusetts and Plymouth herded the Christian Indians into island concentration camps, such as Deer Island in Boston Harbor, where the people suffered malnutrition and exposure. I should note here that the officials who made this decision were somewhat between a rock and a hard place because mobs of English citizens were threatening to kill these people. Um, and the English authorities really did not know what to do, whether to leave these folks, these Christian Indians victims to the mob, put them on the islands or sell them into slavery. Um, they chose what they thought was the, the least of several bad options. Point is, the warring Indians took advantage of these colonial missteps to accumulate victories in which they took the lives of upwards of 3,000 Englishmen, destroyed 16 colonial towns, and slaughtered 800 head of cattle. Eventually, however, the resistance collapsed, partly because other Native people threw in their lot with the English. And here I'd like you to focus on this part of the map. In February of 1676, the Mohawks, the easternmost nation of the Five Nations Iroquois, or Haudenosaunee people, as a gesture to the young English colony of New York, drove Pometacom's winter camp away from Dutch and French gun markets on the Hudson River, and then eastward, back into the teeth of New England forces. Also lying in wait, alongside the English, were the Mohegans and Pequots of Connecticut and various Christian Wampanoags from Cape Cod, who under duress, let's be clear, had sided with the colonies from the beginning and were just as adept in forest war warfare as the resistance fighters. Meanwhile, the warring Indians and their families were stalked by hunger and disease as they lived in cramped quarters on the run away from their cornfields and fishing stations. Consequently, by the late spring and early summer of 1676, growing numbers of them began to accept a late English offer of quarter or mercy in exchange for switching sides. That is to say, in exchange for now fighting on the side of the English. Some native people managed to escape this terrible choice by escaping to the upper Hudson River Valley or Canada, where they built new lives but most of them never made it that far. By June, 1676, native prisoners were telling their English captors that Pometacom was, and I quote, ready to die, for you have now killed or taken all his relations and almost broke his heart. Those relations included his wife, Watuna Kanuski, and one of their sons, we don't know his name, who colonists captured and sold into slavery, likely into the Caribbean. They were but two of an estimated 2,000 Native people, men, women, and children alike, who the English sentenced to slavery during this war. Some of them they put to work in New England, but others they sent away to the West Indies, Gibraltar, and Tangier. Some of these poor souls had surrendered to the English based on that promise of mercy, only to discover that the terms were far harsher than they had been led to believe. Worse still, some surrendering Indians learned too late that colonial authorities would not spare any native man they suspected of having taken an English life during the war. And the standards for that judgment, let me say, were not very high. Massachusetts, Plymouth, and Rhode Island held public executions throughout the summer of 1676, including 50 hangings on Boston Common alone, uh, something I think that the Commons should consider memorializing. The English even exacted retribution on the dead. On August 6, 1676, colonial forces found the drowned body of Wiedemu, a female sachem and war leader and the sister of Pometacom's wife. Authorities ordered her head to be severed and piked next to a holding pen full of Wampanoag prisoners. The captives, according to the colonists' own accounts, quote, 
made a most horrid and diabolical lamentation, crying out, it was their queen's head. A few days later, the Medicom was dead too, shot down by a Christian Indian named Alderman. Filled with a vengeful spirit, Captain Benjamin Church had the sachem dismembered and his head sent to Plymouth. Right there on the very site where the sachem's father had allied and feasted with the pilgrims, authorities mounted their grisly trophy and, mount and put it outside the town gate, leaving it there to rot for the next 20 years. It might very well have been one of the last things that Pometicom's wife saw when Plymouth shipped her from her homeland into slavery. Later that week, Plymouth held a day of thanksgiving in praise of God, for saving the colony from its indigenous enemies. I think we can all agree these horrors are as contrary to the traditional Thanksgiving story as it gets. Though history rarely pays attention to the Wampanoags after King Philip's War, my book emphasizes that this conflict was just the first stage in a centuries long battle to defend their land and sovereignty should come as no surprise to anyone here that the English seized nearly all of the Wampanoag's territory in the decades after the war, leaving only a handful of town-sized reservations for mostly Christian Indians, and you could see most of the uh, communities there. Please note that I didn't frame this process as is so common as the Indians losing their land, as if by mistake. Frame, that's the wrong way to put it. Colonists and their successors took it. The English also seized the Wampanoags as bound laborers. From the late 1600s through the mid 1800s, white merchant creditors, courts, and government appointed guardians colluded to force the Wampanoags and their children into indentured servitude, or as one of my colleagues puts it, judicial slavery to white farmers householders, and whaling merchants. The terms routinely lasted several years, and in some cases, even decades. Such judicial slavery, or debt peonage, made it nearly impossible for Wampanoag people to sustain their normal social patterns, including the process of raising their own children, to the point that few Wampanoag people could speak their natal language by the mid-19th century. Enter William Apis, the Pequot-born preacher to the Mashpee Wampanoags of Cape Cod, who's our second native figure after Pometicom to dispute white Americans' self-serving, sanitized histories. In 1836, right in the midst of Jacksonian Indian removal, let me emphasize, Apis wrote and delivered in public in Boston his Eulogy on King Philip which used a revisionist account of the Pilgrim Saga to call attention to the plight of indigenous people. In it, Apis argued that Indians were the real heroes of Plymouth's founding because they comported themselves like real Christians, whereas the supposedly saintly pilgrims behaved like villains and hypocrites. Apis meticulously laid out, and he had let me uh, stress here, he had read the major primary sources. He laid out how the pilgrims had introduced themselves to the Wampanoags by desecrating their graves and looting their corn, but then had the audacity to turn to Usamequin for help. Yet the chief, to his moral credit, obliged, like a true Christian, imbued with the principles of charity and forgiveness. No people could be used better than they were, Apis intoned. The Wampanoags gave the English venison and sold them many hogsheads of corn. Had it not been for this humane act of the Indians, every white man would have been swept from the New England colonies. Apis also contended that Massasoit's son, Pometicom, was, and I quote, the greatest man that ever lived upon American shores. Apis ranked him even higher than my university's namesake, George Washington, because the sachem had fought against a darker tyranny and for greater freedom 
with far fewer means at his disposal. In Apis's telling, Pometacom was no misguided hothead for taking up arms against colonial dominance. Rather, he was a sage because he foresaw, and I quote, that the white people would not only cut down their groves, but would enslave them. And how true the prophecy. Our groves and hunting grounds are gone. Our dead are dug up. Our council fires are put out. To Apis, it was all an outgrowth of, and I quote again, a fire, a canker, created by the pilgrims from across the Atlantic to burn and destroy my poor unfortunate brethren. In light of this sordid history, Apis proposed that the Indians should treat each December 22nd, the anniversary of the Pilgrims landing in Plymouth, and every 4th of July as, and I quote, days of mourning and not joy. Let them rather fast and pray to the great spirit, the Indians God, who deals out mercy to his red children and not destruction. Stick a pin in his call for a day of mourning. This call by Apis for native people to commemorate that they bore the burden of white America's triumphs would continue to resonate with the Wampanoags and other native people long, long after he was gone. Less than 40 years later, in the late 1860s and early 1870s, Massachusetts addressed the stubborn refusal of the Wampanoags to disappear by dissolving their reservations of Mashpee, Herring Pond, Gayhead, Chappaquiddick, Christiantown, and others. The state divided the common lands of these places into private property tracts, subjected those lands to taxation and confiscation for debt, and declared the inhabitants to be full-fledged citizens and no longer Indians, as if the two were antithetical. White officials congratulated themselves that in their magnanimity, they had bestowed legal equality on Indians, just as New Englanders were pressuring white Southerners to do with black freedmen and women under reconstruction. They refused to listen to the Wampanoags who protested that this supposed gift of citizenship was actually a Trojan horse to rob them of their remaining land and force them to scatter. And that was indeed the point. White proponents of this measure, at their more honest moments, admitted that they considered the Wampanoags to be too racially intermixed to be classified as Indians any, any longer. And that in any case, it was the fate, the manifest destiny of Indians to vanish. And over the next century, white Americans did everything to make that supposedly natural process occur, including reducing native people to bit parts in the country's history, as exemplified by the Thanksgiving myth. Now, let me stress here, Throughout the colonial era, throughout the 1600s, throughout the 1700s, into the 1800s, Thanksgiving had no association whatsoever with pilgrims and Indians. The link between the holiday and that history appears to date to 1841, when the Reverend Alexander Young published a primary source account of a 1621 harvest feast hosted by Plymouth Colony and attended by neighboring Wampanoags. And here you see the account. By the way, there's only two accounts of the feast. Both of them are very short. This is the entirety of the account here. The other one is in uh, William Bradford's of Plymouth Plantation. Now to this account, Young added a footnote, which read, this was the first Thanksgiving, the harvest festival of New England. Now, trust me as a historian, there aren't a lot of famous footnotes out there. I've read a lot of footnotes. Um, most readers don't read them at all. This is one of those famous footnotes, might be the only one. And indeed, over the next 50 years, various authors, artists, and lecturers disseminated Young's idea until Americans began taking it for granted. 
As you might expect, New Englanders were the first to tout the Pilgrims as national founders and their dinner with the Indians as the template for Thanksgiving. But for the rest of the country to go along, the nation first had to subjugate the tribes of the Great Plains and Far West. Only then could white people stop vilifying Indians as bloodthirsty savages and give them an unthreatening role in a national founding myth. The Pilgrim Saga also took hold because it was useful in the nation's culture wars. They had them then, just as now. It was no coincidence that the Pilgrims emerged as founding fathers amid popular anxiety that the United States was being overrun by immigrants. Catholics, mostly from Ireland and Germany, and then later um, from, from Southern Europe, and eventually Eastern Orthodox uh, Europeans and Jews all of whom were supposedly unappreciative of the country's Protestant democratic origins and values. Well, holding up the pilgrims as colonial founding fathers would help to redress that, that stress. Additionally, treating the pilgrims as the epitome of colonial America, a role that they hold really up to this very day, served to minimize the country's record of racial oppression, past and present. Better to highlight the pilgrims' religious and democratic principles instead of the Indian wars and slavery more typical of colonies, all colonies, including those in New England. Through such means, Northeasterners could define the so-called Black and Indian problems as Southern and Western exceptions to an otherwise inspiring national heritage. So what I'm saying here is that though Americans eventually assumed that the Thanksgiving holiday had been associated with pilgrims and Indians since 1621, that tradition was, the, was a product of white Protestants in the 19th century, especially Yankees, asserting their cultural authority over European immigrants, Americans of color, and other regions of the United States. This invention became tradition by the early 20th century and has remained so in no small part through American schools holding annual Thanksgiving pageants in which students dress up like pilgrims and Indians to reenact the first Thanksgiving. I can remember participating in one myself. By the way, I was cast as a tree, uh, which tells you something about my uh, acting skills at a young age. Um, but what I also remember is that we sang My Country Tis of Thee, praising America as a sweet land of liberty and the pilgrims as my fathers. My, fa my last name Silverman. The pilgrims are my fathers. The point was to, to teach a diverse group of school children about who we as Americans are, or at least who we're supposed to be. Even students from ethnic backgrounds would be instilled with the principles of representative government, liberty, and Christianity, while learning to identify with English colonists from 400 years ago as fellow white people. Leaving native people outside of the category of my fathers also carried important lessons. It was yet another subtle reminder about which race ran the country and whose values mattered. Unless we dismiss the impact of such messages, let's consider the experience of a young Wampanoag woman who told me that when she was in grade school, the lone Indian in her class, her teacher cast her as Chief Massasoit in one of these pageants and then had her sing, this land is your land. This land is my land. As a young person, she was just embarrassed about it. But now as an adult, she sees the cruel irony in it. Other Wampanoags have told me about their parents going to school after hearing about such episodes to object to these pageants and invariably the history lessons that followed them in which teachers said that the New England Indians were all gone. Well, there they were at school <laughs> complaining about these, these messages and not, not un, infrequently, these adults would have school officials question in, in person their claims to be Indian. Authentic Indians were supposed to be primitive relics 
uh, meeting a stereotype of what native people looked like 400 years ago. They weren't supposed to be modern people. So what were they doing in school, speaking English, wearing contemporary clothing, driving cars, returning to homes? By 1970, Frank James, the third in our sequence of native revisionist historians, had reached the limits of his patience with this nonsense. James was raised, was born and raised in the community of Aquina, or Gayhead on Martha's Vineyard, which had long ranked as one of the poorest communities in Massachusetts. Nevertheless, James grew up determined to succeed and represent his people. As a teenager, he even adopted the name Wamsutta after the eldest son of Usamequin, who had preceded Pometicom in calling on the Wampanoags to resist colonialism. James's inner drive carried him all the way to the New England Conservatory, where he studied trumpet, and then to the Nauset Public Schools on Cape Cod, where he became director of music. Yet his passion was political activism and the study of Wampanoag history, because he understood that knowing the past was critical to reforming the present. And when he went to the same primary sources as William Apis, what he read made his blood boil, because it bore little relation to the Thanksgiving myth that weighed around his people's neck like a millstone. So when James was invited to speak at a state banquet celebrating the 350th anniversary of Plymouth's founding, he saw it as a rare opportunity to set the record straight. Yet when he submitted a draft of his speech for review, White officials rejected it as too inflammatory. James, for his part, found an alternative script drawn up by the state to be so, and I quote, childish and untrue that he pulled out of the event altogether. Instead, he drew up plans for a commemoration where there would be no censors. Inspired by the Red Power Movement for Indigenous Rights and Justice, James organized a National Day of mourning to be held on Thanksgiving Day 1970 at the site of the Massasoit statue overlooking Plymouth Rock. In choosing this name, James hearkened not only to more recent national days of mourning following the assassinations of John Kennedy and Martin Luther King, he also reached back to William Apis's eulogy on King Philip, which I am certain he read. And like Apis incarnate, when James's moment came, he rose up before protesters from all across Indian country, media and onlookers, and delivered his inflammatory speech. He began with the assertion that he had the rights to the dignity of his humanity, despite society's efforts to diminish him and his people. I speak to you as a man, he stressed, a Wampanoag man. I'm a proud man proud of my ancestry, my accomplishments won by strict parental direction. Despite his family and community suffering, and I quote again, poverty and discrimination, two social and economic diseases. He acknowledged to his many white listeners that Thanksgiving, and I quote, is a time of celebration for you, celebrating the beginnings of the white man. the day had doleful implications. It is with a heavy heart, he explained, that I look back on what happened to my people. And like Apis, James proceeded to tell a history of English Wampanoag relations that turned the bedtime story of the Thanksgiving myth into a nightmare. His conclusion was that Usamequin's welcome of the pilgrims, quote, was perhaps our biggest mistake. We, the Wampanoags welcomed you, the white man, with open arms, little knowing that it was the beginning of the end, that before 50 years were to pass, the Wampanoag would no longer be a free people. To James, like Pometacom, like Apis, the moral of the first Thanksgiving was that the English and their white successors had betrayed the Wampanoags who befriended them in their time of need. And this is the message that has echoed through subsequent national days of mourning, which the United American Indians of New England have continued to hold each Thanksgiving right up to this present day. <laughs>
And so the question for all of us was and is how to move forward. The answer, according to James, is to confront this history, including the fact, as he put it, that the Wampanoags still walked the lands of Massachusetts. James urged his fellow Americans to consider Native people as worthy of the same respect as everyone else. Let us remember, he counseled, the Indian is and was as humane as the white man. The Indian feels pain, gets hurt, becomes defensive, has dreams, bears tragedy, and failure, suffers from loneliness, needs to cry as well as laugh. If the American people followed his counsel to extend their native countrymen and women basic compassion and acknowledgement, it would make Thanksgiving Day 1970 a new beginning toward what James called a more humane America, a more Indian America, in which Native people could, and I quote again, regain the position in this country that is rightfully ours. There are so many reasons for Americans to follow James's lead and attempt to tell the history of Plymouth and Thanksgiving with three-dimensional Wampanoag people at the center. Thanksgiving eclipses Columbus Day as a focal point for considering the Native American role in the nation's past. It's bad enough to have gotten the story so wrong for so long. It's downright inexcusable to continue the annual tradition of having teachers, politicians, and television producers traffic in the Thanksgiving myth and have residential homes and shopping centers sport decorations of happy pilgrims and Indians. These widespread practices dismiss Native people's very real historical traumas at white hands in favor of depicting their ancestors as having consented to colonialism. To call the consequences harmless is to ignore the chorus of Native Americans, our fellow Americans, who say the hurt is profound, particularly to their children. I think we can all agree this population has already suffered far more than its fair share in the creation of the United States. And it shouldn't matter, but I think it does, that Native people have contributed disproportionately to the military in every single one of the nation's wars from the revolution moving forward. In a pluralistic country, I think, it's morally unacceptable to allow the celebration of a national holiday to damage part of the nation's people, never mind the first people. Or for that matter, all the people. There has been too little public reflection about how the Thanksgiving myth teaches white proprietorship of the nation. Why should a school-aged child with the surname of, say, Silverman, identify more with the pilgrims than the Indians. After all, such a student is unlikely to descend from either group, and the descendants of both groups are Silverman's fellow Americans. If the student is taught to think like a historian, more dispassionately about the past, and to consider um, both pilgrims and Indians as they instead of we, it might be a step towards a more critical understanding of history in which we can see all of the actors as fully human with all of the virtues and shortcomings that one would expect to see in any population. At the same time, if the student is taught to think about both groups more inclusively as we, aware of the associated risks of appropriation, it might be a step toward a more compassionate national culture. At the very least, this vision would have school curriculums treat Native American history as basic to an understanding of American history in general. Such lessons would address the civilizations that indigenous people created over thousands of years before the arrival of Europeans. The various ways that they've suffered under and resisted colonization and how they've managed to survive and adapt to modern life having passed through the apocalypse of centuries while maintaining their distinct identities and defending their indigenous rights. Units on American government would address the sovereignty of native tribes as the basic feature of American federalism. 
Such a shift might also feature bringing indigenous people and their concerns into the national conversation. Imagine, for instance, in the general election, having presidential candidates have a serious debate about their Indian policies and the state of Indian country, something I have never seen. If the public continues to associate pilgrims and Indians with Thanksgiving, and I don't think there's any reason to, the very least we can do is try to get the story straight with Wampanoag actors and perspectives at the center. Imagine if instead of trafficking in the mythical Thanksgiving, we as a country reckon with the story as told by Pometacom, William Apis, and Frank James. I'm not naive. I know the challenges are significant at various levels. Many Americans are uncomfortable with the Native American past. It tends to turn patriotic episodes inside out and heroes into villains, or at least into deeply flawed heroes. It loosens white claims on morality and authority. It raises political and cultural concerns about justice. It threatens to tear down monuments and rename buildings. But confronting this darkness also promises to shed light, cultivate national humility, and most importantly, I think, signal the Native people that the country values them as us. As one gracious Aquino Wampanoag elder once told me, we do ourselves no good by hiding from the truth. And I think she was talking about all of us. Amen. Well, thank you. Um, I, I, this was extremely illuminating and really, really hard to hear. Um, but I think that um, important for us to all hear. Uh, we have a couple of comments in the Q&A and I would invite other folks to please, you know, feel free to ask questions or, or to make comments. Um, the first is how can we reverse this horrible mythology? And the, um, the commenter says, I have a stake in this. My ancestor was one of the majority of strangers that arrived on the Mayflower. And this mythology dishonors my ancestor, Richard Warren. I now live on Massachusetts land in Boston. I was born in the land of Powhatan in Norfolk, Virginia. I'm aware of the politics and the history here, particularly that of the upsman, upmanship of Massachusetts. Um, and she goes on to say that Puritan descendants who wanted to put Plymouth, Massachusetts on the map to counter the Anglican influence of both the original Virginia and the original state of Maine. So that is, it's an interesting question to bring the sectarianism of, of the Protestant English into this too. Um, she later, the same commenter comments about the factionalism between the Congregationalists or Puritans and the Anglicans and um, how that too may have been a factor in, in some of this acrimony. Um, she says, I'm constantly dismayed when the term English is used without differentiating between the Puritans and Anglicans in the New England colonial settlements, hence even discrediting the Anglican lawyer, Thomas Morton. He, like most Anglicans of the era, was even more hated by the Puritans than the original natives. Morton was a competitor, the natives were not. Perhaps you'd like to comment on, on that. Sure. I'm familiar with that story. Yeah, let me start with the first part of the question, and then I'll get on to the uh, the question of the importance of religion in in this story. Um, we're having a debate currently in the country. It's one that happens periodically. It's this is not the first time it's arisen about what is the role of history education. Large portions of our country, and indeed, they this is not distinct to them. This has been true for most human societies since the beginning of human societies. Think the purpose of a history education is to cultivate patriotism in young people and in the greater population in order to uphold the authority of the status quo. Now, as a history educator, I don't care if my students come out of my courses feeling patriotic or unpatriotic. That is neither here nor there for me. I think the purpose of a history education is to complex, to capture a complex past in all of its complexity. 
and to help students grasp how we capture and articulate that complexity. Now, I think our patriotism should be based in truth. And I do believe it's possible to capture historical truth. There are a great many things in the American past to be enormously proud about. There are a great many things in the American past to feel ashamed about and to improve on. And if we're going to move forward and build on what's good and, and redress what's not good, we have to have an honest look at our history. That's my take on it. I think it's the take of most history educators, and I will go to the mat um, for that, that argument. As far as religion goes, uh, I'm going to give you an on, an on the one hand and on the other hand. On the one hand, religion doesn't really matter in the broad scheme of things. The English, in the broad scheme of things, treated Native people the same regardless of whether they were Anglican, Congregationalist, Separatist, Presbyterian. The Quakers are, and the Moravians might be the only exceptions in the, in, in the whole uh, scheme of things. But the general pattern is this, that English, English colonization involved transporting men, women, and children to America to acquire land. That makes them very different than, say, the French colonies, which are based on the fur trade, based on productive exchange with Native people, or, or the Dutch, Dutch New Netherland, which is also based on that trade. What they are seeking to do is displace Native people from their land. And so what you end up with in every English colony are wars like King Philip's War. It's not distinct to New England. It happens in every single place the English settle for very simple reasons. The English wanted to subjugate Native people and take their land, and Native people disagreed and were willing to fight over it. Now, on the other hand, um, the fact that New England was populated by religiously motivated people, right? They are not coming to New England because they want to get rich. If they wanted to get rich, they'd go somewhere else. They'd go to Barbados. Uh, they'd go to Virginia. Uh, you know, it's hard to make a living in colonial New England. They're going because they want to set up a society based on their own religious principles. They are the only, New England is the only place in the English colonies that launches a large scale sustained missionary campaign. And so, as you, we saw in the case of, of King Philip's War, um, you know, by the 1670s, there are thousands of Christian Indians in New England. And let me emphasize that Plymouth, um, especially Cape Cod and the islands of Martha's Vineyard in Nantucket, are the only places in English colonial America where you have Christian Indians and colonists living alongside one another over the long term. Now, that is a distinctive feature. Um, now, that's a complex history. As I addressed here, um, despite the fact that Native people and the English were co-religionists, the English exploited their co Native co-religionists with impunity. I mean, they appropriated their land, drove them into debt peonage and, and judicial slavery. At the same time, the fact that you had those missions is what produced the reservations like Mashpee and Gayhead or Aquina that, had a, that allowed Wampanoag people to survive amid that apocalypse to this very day. Uh, so again, it's a very complex history. We have um, several people who are, are grateful for the presentation. Um, we'll be ordering your book. Um, Makes a fine gift. <laughs> one question um, is, uh, if I may assume that you still join in a traditional Thanksgiving meal, mm -hmm. What have been examples of reflections or toasts that you have made? Thank you. Great question. My family is quite tired of hearing me on this uh, on this subject. Um, let, let me be crystal clear about where I stand on the holiday of Thanksgiving. I love Thanksgiving. I am a voracious pie eater. Um, and I love the ritual of getting together with family and friends and offering thanks for what's good in our lives. Who could take issue with that? Indeed, um, many Wampanoag people that, um, that I've talked to about this say, well, our people did this more than once a year, <laughs> traditionally. Um, and boy, I, what a great idea. We all should do it uh, more often. 
I'm not declaring war on Thanksgiving. I'm not canceling, calling for canceling Thanksgiving. What I am suggesting is that we divorce that lovely ritual from this false and I think damaging history. That's what I, I suggest. I, look, you can handle this difficult history any way you wish. I'm not sure a family celebration is, is the right place for it. I would love to see it integrated into our history curriculums. Because look, the fact of the matter is this, the, 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 the Thanksgiving myth is designed to sanitize a fundamentally bloody process of colonialism. Colonial history is horrific. It's horrific. It's two most basic features are Indian colonial warfare, which we are increasingly characterizing as a genocide, and slavery. Though you cannot address colonial America without staring those two modern disasters square in the face. And we've barely taken baby steps towards doing that in our national education system. So, you know, I... I would I would concede um, that, uh, you know, uh, reflective words uh, at the beginning of a meal might be a step towards. Producing a culture that would be more open uh, to that history, but the work is far deeper than that. Um, we we have work to do on our history curriculums and the openness of American society to these very difficult truths. Yeah. Um what was it about the Wampanoag history that interested you to write about this subject? So my first book, um, which derived from my doctoral dissertation, was about the Wampanoag people of Martha's Vineyard. And um, back when, back in the 90s, when I was uh, doing this work, Native people were not as visible in southern New England as they are now. Um, you know, because the casino of Foxwoods had just opened, surprising people all over the region. Said, they said the, the Pequots still exist, right? And Mohegan Sun, and the, you know, those casinos have contributed to the visibility of of Native people, who up to that point had worked very hard to keep their heads down. Right? They did not want to be uh, recognized by society because that never had done them any good um, over over the course of centuries. And uh, you know, during uh, the first trip that I ever took out to the island, I came to realize a that there was a federally recognized tribe uh, on the island, which was news to me. But then B, that the local records, county courts, probate, town meeting minutes, and this wonderful local historical society, now known as the Martha's Vineyard Museum, had reams and reams and reams of historical documentation of these folks, some of it produced by Wampanoag people themselves in their own language because they were they had been evangelized. They had uh, uh, acquired literacy in these missionary schools and were producing their own their own written works. And it, it seemed to me that telling a story um, of a native community that had managed to survive, not thrive, but survive um, an apocalypse that had destroyed so many other groups of people was a story worth telling and reflecting on and, and to ask, you know, why didn't this happen more places uh, than it did? In the course of doing that work, I reached out to modern Wampanoag people and had numerous uh, discussions with them. And what two things kept coming up. One is they said they would talk about Thanksgiving and just how much stress it put on them as a people, as individuals, and especially as young people in school. Because as young people in school, they had to sit there listening to their teachers, authority figures, make a mockery out of their people's trauma, and even deny their ongoing existence, which happened re repeatedly. What they also said to me is, you need to tell this story that brings it up to the present which I wasn't prepared to do at that point. <laughs> yeah, I was still get, just getting a handle on, on uh, colonial uh, America in the 19th century uh, US. Um, but that's what I've done in this book. So I brought the story up to the present. And what they said is, you know, if you don't do that, it reinforces the mistaken impression that we've disappeared. People need to know we're still here. And 
that's one of the reasons I wrote the book. The other reason I wrote the book was that uh, I I conduct teacher training. Uh, I participate in teacher training institutes at Mount Vernon Estate and Gardens, George Washington's ancestral estate, every summer. Teachers come in from all around the country um, to develop their content knowledge about revolutionary America. I lecture about George Washington and Native America. During Q&A, they all ask me about Thanksgiving because all of that's the one cameo that Native people make in their history curricula. And they all recognize that they don't have the foundational knowledge to teach it with the, the depth of detail and complexity that, that it deserves. So another reason I'm writing this book is for the, the millions of teachers out there who reach hundreds of millions of kids every year. So in a related question, any suggestions for elementary school teachers on how to handle the pilgrim pageants they do in the classroom at this time of year? Get rid of them. Yeah, they, there's no excuse. There's, you cannot have a play about colonialism. Colonial, colon, listen, we're having a debate in this the historical field, and it's a serious reason debate about whether we should be characterizing native death and disposition as a genocide. Now, I'm convinced that we should. You want to make a play about that? Would you have a play about the Holocaust? No. I'm not even sure we should be teaching colonial history at the elementary school level. I think it is too violent. It is too horrific. They are not prepared to handle anything approximating the truth of this period. Um, there have There is a comment in here of a book that if uh, people who are interested, a children's book, um, Kipanama Kuyakum's Thanksgiving story, I probably just mangled that name. Um, so anyone who's interested in that might make note of that. Uh, a question about, let me see, you mentioned in the beginning, the Wampanoag uh, leader used the colonists as pawns. Could you elaborate yes. on that? Sure. Um, so too often we characterize the relationship between Native people and colonists as a relationship between one discrete society and another discrete society failing to recognize that Native people are operating in a very complex, multipolar, intertribal environment. And their Native people's relationships with other Native people are usually the driving forces of how they approach colonists. So in the, ca the case of the Wampanoags, Usamequin, Massasoit, wants to enlist them as military allies and trade allies, in part because he wants to fend off subjugation at the hands of the Narragansett people. So that's their pawn in that respect. He, he's trying to enlist them against the Narragansetts. By the way, he does that successfully. Uh, the Wampanoag, in the short term, this is a very successful strategy. The Wampanoags maintain their independence. Usamequin maintains his authority and indeed even enhances his authority because he also becomes a point person for the flow of trade goods from the English to the Wampanoags. Wampanoags are people without metal until Europeans arrive. And all of a sudden, you have this influx of these incredible goods that they really, really want. Um, so his authority is enhanced in all those respects. Um, in turn, it enhances his relationship to other neighboring peoples, uh, Nipmuc peoples, Wabnaki peoples, uh, and the like. That is what I mean when I say that he's using them as, as a pawn. Um, sorry, I'm kind of zigzagging between questions. Uh, one person says, I couldn't agree more with grounding history in the truth. There can be no alternate facts. That said, and to begin with the truth, would the Wampanoag agree with your telling of the history? Yeah. Would could that be considered the authoritative single source of the truth? If so, that's a great place to start. There's no such thing as a single authoritative uh, source of truth. History is a debate, um, and you know, among professional historians, the way that we ground our truth claims is with appeals to primary source evidence. And we argue um, how to interpret sources, which sources we should be using. We um, quibble over whether a historian should have used sources X, Y, Z or not. 
Wamarad truths are not based on that, right? They're based on their own internal standards. Um, and so, you know, look, look, they have takes on this history that are quite different than mine in some cases. Um, let me emphasize, the Wampanoags are complex people, right? Uh, you, you ask one person about this, you might get one take on it. You ask another one, you might get another take uh, on it. Wh what I've heard from Wampanoag people in response to this book is, is this. Um, they genuinely appreciate bringing their story to the fore. Uh, they genu genu genuinely appreciate recognizing the agency that they exercised in history, that they were not just passive victims um, alone, that, you know, they operated according to their uh, their own principles and, and interests. Some Wampanoag people take issue with the my depiction of intertribal power politics, that sometimes uh, they think I'm depicting um, their ancestors as being too cutthroat um, to one another. Um, they say, look, we, you know, th th this behavior is antithetical to our understanding of, of traditional Wampanoag values. My answer to that is this. Our ancestors will always disappoint us. <laughs> they will always act in ways that startle us because all of us romanticize our ancestors. We all like to think of our ancestors as heroes, to think of them as, uh, we're, we're, and we always think of ourselves as falling short of their good example. But they were three-dimensional people with flaws and you know, with, with positive attributes too. Um, and so I, I would say that's where my take and some the take of some Wampanoag people's part. Brendan. If you have time, two more questions. Sure. Um, the first is, where does telling this story stand with the state public school curricula? Uh, who are the forces resisting it? Are they in leadership positions? Mm -hmm. And who are more sympathetic or the most sympathetic voices, ones that need our support? That I don't know. Uh, I, I, I'm not an expert on Massachusetts um, uh, state standards, but it, I can speak in a more general way about state standards across the United States because I've heard I've, I've heard from educators from almost every state in the union um, with very rare exceptions. Native American history is not a priority in um, in state standards, um, nor is the relations between uh, colonists and native people, never mind later white Americans and native people. Uh, because again, it, it address uh, looking this story square in the face, it destroys, it just shreds uh, the patriotic themes that many politicians, especially, um, want featured in in history now it might come as some surprise to you uh, which states have taken the the um greatest steps towards redressing this problem montana uh is one um in no small part because it has a very significant native american population a uh, maine has taken some significant steps um in no small degree because of the penobscot people and other wabanaki uh groups in in maine that have uh, you know worked so hard uh, to change distortions of their past uh, in in the curriculum. But, you know, we have a long, long way to go. And, you know, I, I will say this. At the academic level, the study of Native American history is thriving. We are my peers are producing works of scholarship that are redressing these wrongs that are sophisticated, that are wide ranging, um, that are grounded and reason, but the gulf between the scholarship that's being produced in American colleges and universities and what's being taught in the secondary and primary schools is enormous. And we think that that's where public history sites can really step Absolutely. in. Absolutely, yep. Um, can you comment on the theory that Native American ideals of social equality were influential forces in the French Revolution? So there are French thinkers um, stretching back to colonial New France. Uh, there are some Jesuits who uh, write very romantic portrayals of, of Native American society, mostly as a foil to what they considered to be the excesses of, of Europe. These are not let me emphasize, these are not accurate depictions of how Native society worked, and they weren't intended to be. Yeah, what they were 
intended to do is shame Christians, you know, civilized Christians, for not living up to the standards of whom these Jesuits consider to be savage pagans, right? But but that discourse em- evolved from the 17th century and eventually, you know, influenced people like Rousseau, um, who were so influential in, in French intellectual uh, thought uh, during the revolutionary uh, revolutionary period. I must emphasize, I must emphasize, though, that these thinkers were not they weren't really concerned with whether they were depicting native society accurately in three dimensional terms. What they wanted to do is reform French society. Um, so be very careful in using their accounts as ethnographic sources for, you know, 17th and 18th century Native America. Thank you. Um, I hope you get a chance to look at the Q&A and see the the really thoughtful praise that, that this talk you are, are receiving. Um, well, thank you. And uh, I, I want to conclude by saying that um, no national history is going to be complete until we tell everyone's story. And sometimes that's gonna be a tough thing to do um, because it's hard to hear messy, painful history, but we can't go forward unless we acknowledge the past. So thank you for a first step tonight. I think for many of us um, in fully understanding the, um, the background to the Thanksgiving myth and where it diverged so dramatically from the horrible truth. So thank you again. Thank you to everyone who joined us tonight. Um, I'll be following up with you and uh, giving you some information that you might find useful. And I'll also pass along Professor Silverman's email in case you have further things that you'd like to say or ask. Um, Thank you again tonight. And um, I wish you all well. Good night.